BBC4 Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. For this collection, Max Hastings has selected interviews with Great War veterans filmed in the 1960s. More programmes on this theme and other BBC4 Collections are available on BBC iPlayer. During a quiet period of the line, in, um, in autumn 1915, when we were doing the regular four days in the line and four days out, and of course during the four days we were out with plenty of fatigues to be getting on with, we came out on one occasion and we were ordered to get rid of, we were covered in mud as usual, we were told to get rid of all this mud, clean up all our equipment, because tomorrow we were going to be in, in, inspected by someone pretty high up. We weren't told it was. Well, we made ourselves fairly presentable, and the next morning we set off we marched to I think 10 or 15 miles to it till we came to a little valley with a road running along the bottom of it. And uh, we found a lot of other units already assembled there that we took our allotted places and waited. And of course we waited, oh, I think, three or four hours before anything happened. And then of course eventually along came a contingent of staff cars and uh, these high ups got out of their car and the cars and proceeded to mount their charges. I believe that there was um, an orderly uh, flying a miniature royal standard behind the king. Well, he rode along the first three or four ranks and um, went across the road and around the other three or four ranks the other side, speaking to an officer here and there, you know. Well, our instructions from the beginning had been that uh, at the conclusion of the parade, uh, we were to put the, um, our caps on the points of our um, fixed bayonets and wave and cheer. So, of course, that is what we did. Hip, hip, hooray. Well, the king's horse reared, and and he fell off. He seemed to slide off. And, of course, the second hip, hip, and that sort of fizzled out. It was quite a fiasco. And then um, you should have seen the confusion as, uh, as these other high-ranking officers hurriedly tried to dismount to, uh, to go to the king's assistance. Uh, they got him up, and, and the last we saw of him was being hurriedly driven away in, uh, I don't know, it was a field ambulance or a staff car. During the night of the 24th, 25th September 1915, the infantry battalion to which I belonged was moved up into reserve trenches almost opposite the Hohenzollern Redoubt. As we came up, we had passed through many squadrons of, squadrons of British cavalry who were assembling, I suppose, to, to be able to exploit any breakthrough that the infantrymen could make the next day. Uh, we didn't get any sleep all night because even before we got there, our artillery barrage was blazing away and we sat there huddled in these in this uh, sort of communication reserve communication trench. Uh, it was a long, really miserable night. Some chaps were crying, some were praying. But really, we were all optimists. We all hoped that we should come through. As soon as it was light, we were issued out with a big ration of rum. You could drink as much as you wanted of it. And we were told that we were to be prepared to receive orders to advance at any moment. Well, the any moment was quite a long while coming, and of course that was a very, very trying period. I believe it was actually two hours before we got the, the uh, actual order to advance. Just before then, we were issued out with two uh, additional bandoliers of um, ammunition, although our pouches were already full, so we were carrying a pretty heavy weight of ammunition. We clambered up out of this trench. Some of us had ladders and some just got out as best they could. And we very soon found ourselves picking our way over the bodies of men who'd fallen in the earlier attacks that morning, and a wounded men who were trying to crawl into shell holes to get protection. The enemy fire wasn't too bad for the first two or three hundred yards, but all of a sudden they opened upon us with terrific machine gun fire. A lot of this was coming from a huge slag heap on our right. We went on and on and on, and we, we, we sensed that... that that uh, we were getting fewer and fewer as we went on. I think about 20 of us got as far as the German wire, but that had been very well knocked about by our tolling, there was hardly any obstacle. 
But when we reached the far side of the German trench, the, the trench was in, appeared to be in jolly good shape. It had hardly been knocked about at all, and it was still quite neatly sandbagged. But as we looked down into it, we saw, I think, half a dozen Germans running backwards into one of their communication trenches leading rearwards. So we just managed to get in a few parting shots at these chaps before we jumped down into the trench. And the men who were carrying bombs um, went and chopped them down the hole to the dugouts uh, either side. And uh, I, in about 20 minutes, we satisfied ourselves that this German trench was completely evacuated. Then we got orders to advance again. All this time, there was much less intense machine gun fire. Uh, but I think we less, even less than 100 yards, we came to a second German trench. Now, this trench had really been plastered. It resembled nothing but um, a string of shell holes, although that the fact that it had been a trench, you could see by little bits of the parapet remained here and there. We jumped down into this, but we found it was so shallow that we hadn't sufficient cover to, to fire um, forward out of it. Um, we had to get busy with our entrenching tools and make it deeper. Uh, so one man would be digging away and the next man to him firing over the top and then sort of changing round. Well, from that time on, we received no further orders. Whether the, the attack on our flanks had been held, I couldn't say. But we were there at least two hours before anything happened. And then I think by that time, the Germans began to realize where we were, because they started sweeping the, the parapet of what was left of it with machine gun fire. Then they sent over a lot of this shrapnel, but most of that burst behind us and didn't do any damage. And presently, they opened up with their 15-pounder guns, uh, what we call the whiz-bangs. That was a thing that made a, a crater about a yard across and about 12 or 18 inches deep. But that was the sort of thing that as long as you were two or three yards away from where that burst, you, you were all right because the blast all went up in the air. But I'm afraid we lost our platoon sergeant and corporal through direct hits in the trench. Well, the hours wore on and it became dusk, and then we heard rattling and rustling behind us, and wonder whatever this could be. And strong detachments of the guards managed to, to get in, and, and were taking our places. They, uh, they relieved us in much greater strength than we'd been all day, whereas we'd been about one man to about ten yards of trench, they had a man every couple of feet. Well, word was passed along for the Sherwood Foresters to assemble in groups and to withdraw. Well, of course, as we withdrew over the ground that had been captured that day, the sight was incredible. It was just like a, a flock of sheep lying asleep in a field. And it became evident that the regimental stretcher bearers, who one time had been bandsmen, had been unable to cope with such a huge number of casualties. Quite a number of the men were still alive, and they were crying out and begging for water. They plucked at our legs as we went by. One hefty chap did grab me by round both legs and held me. And I was going to take the cork out of my hot water bottle, to, uh, out of my bottle, out of my water bottle, to give him a drink. And I was immediately prodded on by behind by someone saying, get on, get on, we're going to lose touch with a column in front. We shall get lost. Uh, in the years that have passed, that man's pleadings have haunted me. Yes, it was a dreadful experience, there's no doubt about that. Still, those of us who survived, you just think, I'm jolly lucky. <laughs>